Okay, everyone, let's get started. And hopefully, if anybody's dropping in late, they can catch up really quickly. Thanks for joining us for how to engage customers and deepen relationships. What startups can teach enterprise about transactional email? I'm Megan Tobin, VP of Marketing here at Dispatch by Send With Us, and I'm your moderator today. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, and that is Matt Harris, our founder and CEO at Send With Us, who has extensive email and product expertise. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Matt. All right, let's get going. So, a little brief background on the on Send With Us. Uh, we started in January 2013. We're one of the top 300 email senders in the world based on email volume with well over 800 customers now. We're back to some of the best investors in, um, in Silicon Valley. All right, so why are we here today? One of the core learnings we have out of working with numerous startup and you know, growing unicorn style private companies is um, how they differentiate themselves from the enterprise that they're disrupting. Um, so that's what we really want to talk about today is like, what do they do that's so great? What can enterprise learn from that? Um, so we're gonna talk through kind of like, what, what email are we talking about? Why does it matter? Really dig into why these emails are important throw out some bad examples of, of how some companies are really failing with these, and then walk you through some really great examples and hopefully give you a few concrete takeaways for what you can improve and how you can kind of address this. And then kind of close up with, at a deeper level, how to make fundamental organizational changes to kind of address the pitfalls of these emails. All right, so let's get going. So um, we're talking about transactional email, and, um, but I want to start a little bit higher level. Um, we did a report with the CMO Council earlier this year. It's really, really interesting. We have the full reports available on our site. One of the things we, we take out of it was that 87% of CMOs and VP of marketing are saying they're not realizing the full revenue potential of their existing customers, meaning that you know, they're leaving money on the table because they're failing to maximize customers they've already acquired. And then 64% said they're either they're failing to effectively leverage transactional emails or they're not even trying. So they've got existing customers that, mark, that they've acquired, that they're um, engaging with their product or brand somehow, um, and they're not even trying to uh, leverage transaction order to engage with them. So there's a direct correlation between the failure of trying to work, uh, you know, effectively use transactional email and um, failing to uh, leverage the growth potential of existing customers. And that's kind of what, why we think this is, is really important, why we want to dig in on it. You know, just kind of taking a deeper look, like what do we mean when we talk about transactional we're also talking about triggered, automated, and any kind of system-generated email. Uh, every company and every organization has their own names for these. What we're really talking about are any kind of like one-to-one -one triggered emails from your company or your product or your subscription system out to a customer. A deep part of the, the customer experience, why we, that's why we think they're so important. So some common examples, things like an order confirmation or an abandoned card, pass reset, welcome email. Maybe some more advanced examples like um, app notifications or um, shipping notifications. All of these are examples of what we consider transactional emails. So why are they so important? Well, we just talked about how that 87% of CMOs uh, don't think they're maximizing current customer revenue. Well, 80% of your future profits are going to come from those, ex those uh, existing customers. As, cust as net new customer acquisition gets, gets tougher and tougher for enterprise, Maintaining those long-term relations relationships and and extending the lifetime value of customers is you know increasingly important and a huge component of that is going to come from how you're engaging with those customers long-term. What's the customer experience looking like? And the transactional emails are a core component of that. Why are they a core component? Because they're they're sent to all these existing customers all the way throughout the customer lifecycle. Everything from post-purchase to when people are considering referrals and retention or, or repurchase. Transactional emails are every step of this life cycle. Um, Post-purchase, you're getting a payment receipt around referrals. You can use transactional emails to leverage referrals, as well as retention-wise. There's, there's many, many different examples, but these emails are core to the customer life cycle. So if we, if we acknowledge that it's getting harder and harder to acquire net new, and our, uh, we're going to be growing revenue through existing customers we're already working with, it only makes sense that enterprise needs to focus on the existing customers and, and leverage transactional emails in order to do that. That's one part of the strategy. All right. So hopefully I've gotten you uh, bought in and excited that there's an opportunity here because I think it's a pretty huge opportunity. Why are startups really great at this and what will enterprise struggle? In general, startups tend to excel over um, enterprise because they're hyper-focused on building extremely loyal customers and, and, and building extremely awesome customer experiences. And they do that because the startup team is smaller, uh, it can move faster, and um, people working on the startup can collaborate and, and change things faster 
um, to address these things. So for example, like when they're a startups acquiring their first thousand or 10,000 customers, that's so important to the success of that company. Everyone on the company is laser focused on how do we ensure that these people are successful? How do we ensure that they like our product and have a good time? And we want to overall net ensure they have an amazing experience. So every single step of that customer lifecycle, including these vital transactional emails, are, inc are included in this focus and they're in they ensure that they're made into a great customer experience. And this is what enterprise typically misses is it because of the size and the speed the enterprise moves at, transactional emails aren't owned by people who are laser focused on this customer experience um, and ends up being a pretty big, big missed opportunity. So how bad can they really get? This is an example of a itinerary receipt email from a, a major North American airline. Um, and this is the, the top of the email. And you can see the top of the email, <laughs> Not only is it plain text and it's uh, not even like formatted super nice, all it is is an introduction to how to get Adobe Acrobat Reader in order to read a PDF, which in, in this day and age, like, I think most people can, can uh, read PDFs. But on top of that, this is not how you want to reward a customer who just bought something, who just engaged, who just converted. And that's like the most engaged a customer going to be. There's a lot of anxiety around travel and flights in general. And then when you get your itinerary in your email, you can't even actually see it up front. You can't, you don't see the confirmation. You just see a wall of text that is not helpful. This makes like a pretty bad customer experience overall. I always find that do not reply a nice friendly <laughs> touch too. Yeah, I mean, the do not replies are an entire webinar, an entire different topic, which I'm very passionate <laughs> about. I'll address it a little bit here. So what's the basics of exceptional email? This, kind of, this is kind of like what I consider table stakes, but for many enterprises, it's actually quite challenging. But maintaining brand consistency, some of the best examples of transactional email, uh, what I love about them is that they look exactly like the website or the mobile app does. So it's almost hard for you to, to discern, am I looking at an email or am I looking at the website? If you can achieve that, that's amazing. Uh, but the baseline is like, hey, use the same logo, styles, and overall look and feel of your website that you have in your email, and you're going to do really well here. Personalization in this case means more than just first name, last name. The simple things you can do here in your transactional. Transactional emails, remember, are, are being sent by some kind of like backend system, right? And so you have access to customer data when you're building these emails and you're deciding what information to go into them. So you can acknowledge things like subscription status or acknowledge um, the number of purchases the customer has or anything you can do to, to deepen that relationship and, and tell the customer, hey, we value you. That's going to that's gonna be a beneficial or at the very least, it's worth testing you out. Um, sure, ensure you're doing that. There's nothing worse than getting a payment receipt from a company that you've been very loyal to. And um, it just feels like it's they've spent no time in, in that email and it's, it's just all plain text or everything else. Um, it doesn't even say, it doesn't even have your name. Understanding your audience. So this is where I address the do not reply. Do not reply is, is really a bad practice, but going farther than that, like you have to think about your audience and your consumers, who's receiving your emails, and then how as a brand are you talking to them? Examples here is like if you're a social site, um, like back in the day, MySpace, every email from MySpace was from Tom at MySpace. And so they personalized, they, the brand was speaking from, the, from an individual. A company like, like Dispatch, all of our transactional emails, they're from the Dispatch team um, because it's, it's a little bit higher level. Uh, this is, you know, we're a business. And um, there's actually a whole team of people behind Dispatch that are working on the products. When you're getting a transactional email, that's who it's coming from. When you go much wider from Amazon, you don't receive emails from the Amazon team, but you, you receive emails from the, from the product, from, um, from Amazon Web Services or from the Amazon Store or from um, Amazon Books or, or whatever else. And so you're, you're messaged at the brand level. So this is what you have to think about in the transactional emails is who is the email coming from to the consumer and ensuring that that's set up correctly and that it looks really great. Make sure you have the, the from name, everything else, and make sure you don't do it. I don't do not reply. There's a couple extra things here. Um, we're now in a, in a mobile first world. 54% um, of all emails are going to be opened on, on that email. Um, and a lot of people are going to delete those emails. They don't look great. And so ensuring that your emails are responsive and they show really important things uh, on mobile is, is, is uh, super important. I think there's some interesting stats showing the number of um, people who open first on mobile and then kind of like action on desktop. This is still a really common pattern we see where you're out and about and you get an email notification, you, you take a look and you open it, and that's your first open on mobile, but you're like, oh, like, you know, this is something I can deal with when I get home, and you just you, uh, you know, close the, the email app, but when you get back to your desktop, you're gonna go back into that email and, and do whatever you need to do and you know, click the call to action or wherever else. 
And so I think that pattern is really important to, uh, to, wa to watch for in your email. And um, depending on who you're sending your emails through, you should be able to get analytics to tell you if that's, something is, if that's a trend that you're seeing in your email. If it, and if it is, it's something you can, you can personalize around and do something interesting with. Another thing I, I kind of consider table stakes is A, your email should include a single call to action, which means that it should include at least one, uh, but probably not a whole lot more. So an order confirmation might have a link back to your site to track your shipment, like a friend request notification is gonna have a confirm, and everything else. One of the things most companies miss here in transactional email, the, 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 the two ways people make a mistake here is one, they have what we have, they, they create what we call a dead end email. So it's a, a vital transactional email that is being sent to every consumer at a certain stage in the life cycle. Um, they have no call to action in the email whatsoever. And I, think that, I don't think there's any excuse for doing this. Every email should have a call to action. Even if it's just click here to go back to your dashboard, click here to go back to your billing history, like something. There's, there has to be something of value you can provide to the customer that they're going to be able to click through and go back to the site. And so that, we call that a dead end email when there's no call to actions. And I think that's something to really look, look out for because you're missing a chance to engage with the customer there and, and, and have them uh, go deep with your product. On the flip side of having way too many call to actions, and especially in transactional and triggered email, because there's, there's a sent one to one is, is diluting um, the reason why you send the email and the reason why the customer might, might want to engage with it. So is that there's a, you know, there's some are, there are some scenarios where more than one might make sense. You have to think really carefully about that. All right, let's go into some of the goods. These are some of my favorites. All right, so this is a welcome email from Asana. Um, which is a task management, project management product. You can see on the right-hand side is kind of just a view of the top of the email. What I really love about this email is the, the use of an animation just to show what Asana is going to help you do, and that it's going to help you tick things off your to-do list. Um, and that's kind of like the core value prop of Asana is like using this platform, you're going to be more productive and you can get more things done. And I think this is a great example to visually show it right at the top of the email. I think it's awesome. It's, it's really great. Part of how this email gets exceptional is, is the uh, the clear H1 and all the rest of the clear messaging in this. Like it's very, very clean email, which I love as well. It's perfectly on brand for Asana. It doesn't quite look like their website or their or their, any of their apps, um, but it is on brand for in terms of, of fonts, colors, and everything else, which I think is great. My only critique of this email is that the call to action is going to be hidden below the fold, especially on mobile, which is a little bit risky from Asana, but I think they're, they're, um, they're making the bet that the animation they have is going to be engaging enough that people are, are going to want to go out and scroll down and click through. Um, overall, I think it's a really excellent uh, welcome email. Here's an example from a, a really great uh, clothing company called MeUndies. Um, so this is an order confirmation email. If you, if you haven't experienced any of the MeUndies marketing or, or, or uh, messaging before, opening with this giant hero image of this, this couple uh, is like this is on point for their brands. This email looks like their website. It looks like every other piece of marketing they have, which is awesome. And then it opens with just with uh, you know the full sentence paragraphs here of acknowledging the customer uh, and thanking them for shopping. And it's it's really straightforward. It's not a lot of text, but I think it's a really nice way to balance the, the massive hero image with some simple language saying, "Hey, we've acknowledged your we've, we've got your order." Thanks a lot. We appreciate it. You can see kind of on the left-hand side in the middle here, it def they do include like a, a standard receipt style information like with line items, which is which is really great as well. Um, how this order confirmation email gets exceptional is when you go look down to the, the bottom, they've got a referral component baked in their order confirmation, which I think is, is awesome. I think I think this is a great use of, of space in the transactional email. It's small and it's tasteful and it's uh, just a small percentage of the overall email, but giving people the invitation of, hey, do you want to do you want to refer a friend? And what Miani does here, which is really great, is it's a it's a double sided referral. So if I make the referral, I'm getting twenty dollars, but I'm also giving my friend who I refer twenty percent off their first purchase. That's a really great offer from Miani. That's really generous, um, and I think it's very tastefully done in this order confirmation email. So I'm a big fan of this email. This is an example of a password reset email from a, uh, a messaging uh, app called Crisp. So this is, uh, sorry, this is um, live messaging. And so what's, this is my favorite password reset email. Um, what they've done here is so, so smart. So first of all, the table stakes. This is on brand. Um, this looks and feels like the Crisp website. The messaging here is really, really simple. Uh, and it has a really great re recover my password call to action, which is front and center. What Crisp has done that's really amazing is the below the fold component here that says tired of forgetting your password. 
um, and they linked to three of the top password management uh, apps. So these are not affiliate links. These are just straight up web link links to their websites. And the other thing amazing here is Crisp has acknowledged that, hey, if people are forgetting their passwords, they're probably not using password management. So we, Crisp, as a brand, can provide more value to our customers. We can help them if we, by making a recommendation here. And like, there's, no, there's no monetary value. This is just creating goodwill and a good customer experience overall. So I, I love this password reset email. I love, I love just in general providing value back to your customers. Um, where it makes sense and like that not having to be necessary like a, a monetary transaction I think it's really great if I had to if I had to have any complaints about this email which I do um, <laughs> there's a there's a um, I think four different font sizes styles color like font sizes colors and um, some metallics mixed in and so I, I think it could be cleaned up a little bit from the topography side but I'm really nitpicking uh, when I get to that level so uh, overall, an amazing email from the Chris team. Uh, so I'm super happy about that. Final example, I, I know I'm, I'm nerding out a little bit with these emails, but these are really great. This is an abandoned cart email from Chubby's, which is, which is it's an amazing and clean email. Um, again, we're on brand. We have a single call to action. A great use of, of like giant H1 text um, will allow me to transport you back to your shopping cart. And a really great image, kind of on brand for the Chubby's brand. Um, I think one of one of the cool things they've done here from a product standpoint, this is just isn't just like abandoned cart, like click here to go back to the site. That takes you back to like a checkout page with your shopping cart, which I think is really sweet. Um, and uh, it's a great email from Chubby's. How are these how are these startups and these companies getting to the point where they can get these really email these emails really good? You know, I started the webinar trying to establish in your mind the value of the transactional email in relation to growing uh, revenue from existing customers. And I think startups re recognize this. They recognize the importance of these emails to their bottom line. They, there's stats saying that, you know, the existing customers are going to spend 67% more on average than new customers. Startups are acknowledging that they, this is a useful uh, and, like, really valuable, important thing. What they're doing at an organizational level is ensuring that the teams that care most about the customer are able to collaborate and get involved in these emails and ensure they're really great experiences without creating long processes or, or like having kind to of go back to engineering too much or, or whatever else. Like there needs to be a like a quick way that people can collaborate and work on and change these emails. As marketing priorities change, like maybe referral programs become more important or less important. You need to be able to reflect that change in the transactional email just like you're doing it everywhere else. And that's key to maximizing revenue potential of these transactional emails. So you, you can do this too. Like um, you know, every co company out there sends some baseline of transactional emails. Acknowledges there can be a, a significant revenue lift from, the, from these emails. You know, you can look at it from uh, increasing revenue from existing customers or, or increasing repurchases from existing customers. You know, there's a lot of different compelling arguments I can make, but at the end of the day, these emails are fundamental into the customer lifecycle. And so, at the very least, you want to ensure that these messages are on brand and look great. Otherwise, it's kind of a, a slap in the customer's face because they're engaged with your brand, they're purchasing something, and then you're not treating them to like a high quality experience like you might be on your website or your app or anywhere else. Um, so again, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna hammer this home, but prioritize these transactional emails. Get them outside of the source code or you know, get them away from, from your engineering team who truly don't wanna own um, the look and feel and the content of these emails, and put this in, in the hands of your product team, product marketing, or, or just pure email marketing teams to ensure that they can make sure they're on point. You know, you need systems that allow you to, to edit and reuse email components. Obviously, the, the, the minute when you when you build, take these emails outside of source code, you need to reduce the amount of overall work it is to maintain and change these emails over time. We talk to a lot of customers and um, um, a really painful process for them is going through a rebrand or, or a logo update. This can literally take a enterprise more than a year to do a logo update in all of their transactional emails. And I think if that's the state you're in, if it's gonna take you a year to do a brand update in your transactional emails, there's no way you're gonna be able to effectively use these emails to drive customer revenue or drive retention. Um, there's just, you're not gonna be able to move, be able to move fast enough and, it, and that's a key indicator that the right people, the people who are hyper-focused on that customer experience, don't have control over those emails the way they need to. And so that's something to think about. There's a component here though of that like, um, these emails are core to the customer lifecycle. So security and trust is a really huge thing. When I say trust, I mean trust within your, your organization. Your engineering team needs to be able to trust that these emails are gonna work. Your product team has to trust that these emails are gonna work. Your legal has to trust that these emails are gonna be compliant. And so ensuring that there's a, there's a process and workflow that that's, people can trust is super important.
This is our shameless plug. Dispatch from some of us is a enterprise level platform that does just this. It's a collaboration platform so anyone, in, well not anyone, but different people on your team can create and change these email templates fast, really fast with workflow and controls and all the different kind of device testing you might need to ensure these emails are going to be really great every time. This is our bread and butter. We've been doing this for a number of years and happy to field questions from the product side. But even, even without that, I really want you to think that 80% of email, enterprise marketing leaders are not realizing the full potential of their existing customer. This is a known problem. There's, there's, a, there's a gap here. And 64% say they're, they're overall failing to leverage or they're not even trying to leverage transaction emails as part of this. Uh, and I think, that's, I think that's worth a change. Your customers deserve a change. And I don't care if you use our platform to accomplish this or, or if you do something else, but I do think that your customers deserve a better experience and they deserve, you know, they deserve your very best. And that's what it's, it's uh, important to change. Yeah, so um, I think we're going to open up to questions now. Yep, we have a couple. We have a couple that have come through already. If you have any questions for Matt, please uh, type them in the question tab, and I will be happy to ask them. Uh, I'm going to start with the two that have come in so far, and this first one is one that's kind of close to my heart. So I'm definitely <laughs> excited for you to. I'm glad somebody asked this question. Mm -hmm. Matt, these emails don't typically fall under marketing's responsibility. How do you suggest marketers push for changing that? Yeah, that's a, a really great question. So I think it comes back to who currently owns those emails within the organization. What we typically see is that it is um, the engineering organization that owns these emails. And so the liaison between engineering and marketing is often product management. So the challenge to marketing is to go to product management and make a compelling case. Marketing has sufficient need to collaborate and work and edit and change these emails that it's going to be too much work for product management to uh, like kind of like be the, the go-between, creating tickets and tasks and having the engine team then respond. So there's, a, there's an argument there that, that can be made, and that's, that's usually fairly straightforward. You say, hey, we want to be able to change these emails um, like once a week. Any product manager can be like, well, I don't want to dedicate engineering time every weekly to doing this. That doesn't make any sense. And then the next, the next stage of this is, as well is providing back viable solutions to the product management team of what could work here. This is where this gets less unbiased. But um, I mean, if you, if you take one of our white papers on, on how project managers can uh, do you know, content collaboration over email better, we, we, have, we have those white papers, you can provide that to your, to your product management team as an argument for, hey, like, here's data showing that you know, we can use this solution to solve this problem, and it's going to be good for you, it's going to be good for the engineering team, and it's going to solve this need for marketing. Now, that's, that's one way. And you could, other ways are to just make the revenue argument that there needs to be like a solution discovery overall. It's a really great way to accomplish that problem. But I think ultimately, like going to whoever has control and really laying out the problem of what you're trying to accomplish and, and the, the revenue and customer impact, that's going to how you can kickstart that conversation. Great. We had a good question that came through uh, based on something you said. When you say get these emails out of the code base, exactly how hard is that to do? That's a really great question. I think. The hard problem of, of getting email outside of source code, and let, I'm going to take a step back. And what do I mean when we're talking about that? When an engineer or a, or a, a programmer is first building, let's say, like a, a software or a website, when, so, when they have code that handles when someone signs up, they're going to put the HTML template for the welcome email alongside the code that handles the, the website. And as a company, as, an, as a product grows, every single email is going to be in the code base alongside um, the sign-up code. So it's generally uh, not too difficult to take an email outside of source code, outside of source code, and, and you're typically like for our customer base and our product, as an example, it's um, you're changing a couple lines of code, um, and uh, our product is completely compliant with just generic HTML templates. So it's not that's not a big challenge. The challenge of making that switch is um, picking a solution that's going to be right for your organization. It's it's not about how hard is it to take it out of source code. It's it's how hard it is to find the, the a platform that's going to work for your organization um, and that um, people are going to buy into. The, the overall, the amount of engineering work, no matter where those templates are going, is generally fairly minimal. Um, um, to get this question, you know, it's high level to get specific on our platform. Like, this can be done in a matter of, of hours or a day. Um, and uh, for other platforms out there, I'm assuming it's, it's similar amounts of time. Uh, follow up to that, can you give a specific example of a process improvement that any of our customers were able to make after implementing a solution like this? 
Yeah, absolutely, I can. So this is more specific to our platform, so I'll, I'll answer specific to our platform, if that's okay. One of the key components of our platform is the ability to have workflow around the approval of changes to an email. So uh, let's say I'm, a, I'm on a team and it's for our subscription email, so there'll be a subscription email team, and someone on the marketing team, for example, wants to go on one of the subscription emails and add in um, some new code or, or change a banner or something. So they would independently go, go through the dashboard, make their changes, um, and then they submit it for approval, at which time a administrator for that team and other people can be or get notified, and they can go in and actually review the email and see the changes and run their own tests before they approve it. Now what's really the, the process change here is that often when these emails are getting changed, the process the, the process is that someone makes the change and then they work with an engineer to fire off test emails to all the different stakeholders involved. And then they kind of just wait for a day or two, uh, assume it's okay, and then the, the change goes live. And I, I can't, seriously, the number of times I've talked to like director of marketing or, or director of product marketing or something like that, those titles, and they're like, yeah, my team went live with an email. Um, I didn't actually see it because like, their inbox gets flooded with different emails all day long, so they didn't see the test email. And then a day later, someone higher up in the food chain came back to them and said, hey, why did this email go live? And so adding in like a, a actual workflow around, um, around the publishing of email sounds very simple, but I think this is the number, number one process improvements we've seen. And it, it helps the people making the changes and it helps the people who have to approve the changes as, as well. And provides there after that an audit trail of how it all happened. If an so here's another question that came, just came in. Mm -hmm. if, a, if an organization is looking to revamp their transactional emails, how can they be most successful in implementing these changes? That's an interesting question. So if an organization is looking to revamp all of the transactional emails, how, how can they be most successful in implementing the changes? I think this is a, a bit of a, a deeper topic in general. These rebrand projects where you're going in and changing every email, every single email template, tend to stretch out for a really long time. So my first, my first point would be, um, if you're looking to revamp all your emails, that's the perfect time to reevaluate uh, re how you're storing and, and collaborating on those emails. If all your emails are in source code and you're looking to revamp them all, that's gonna be an extremely painful process and it'll be way less painful to um, first change how you're storing those emails using a content management platform like us as an example, um, and then going through the process of changing them all. That would be my number one. I was like, look at how the emails are currently being stored and just, just, just questioning like, is the status quo still okay? And the answer could be like, yes, we still wanna keep building this in source code, that's fine. I think you wanna start with that question. The next thing I would, I'd wanna look at is, is kind of answering the question of, okay, we're looking at changing all, all of our emails. How are our, how are our emails built today? Um, and when I say built, what I'm referencing is that when you use a system like ours or any other email management system out there today, the concept of building emails through components is now kind of like de facto for these platforms. And so you wanna look at, are your emails using components today? And if they're not, you wanna look at, okay, can we move to a component-based email system? And why, why are components so important? Components are what you're gonna be using in the future to ensure that every email has a standard header and footer. Um, they can still be dynamic, but every email is gonna have the same look and feel and the same buttons and the same CSS and, and all of this. You're gonna, if you're building emails through components, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be way more successful in doing that. And so in general, what's, what's important there is if you're looking at revamping, you need to look at what are the current technologies used to build, build email and how can we catch up? Does your current email process have built-in device testing or built-in testing for staging and development as well as production? Like look at those kind of questions too and, and um, kind of, you know, overall, if you're doing a, a rebrand of all emails, it's a good time to challenge the status quo of every step of how you're building emails today to ensure that you're not wasting time. What I mean there is that changing the platform, changing how this content is hosted and collaborated on, could mean that uh, you're going from a year-long project, because this is gonna, it'll, it'll drag out, and it's gonna happen in a matter of weeks instead. Uh, and that's a ton of time saved, and that gets to a point where you can actually start moving effectively. That's a, I think that's a much deeper topic though on like how to rebrand emails in general, I think is, is super interesting, so I'm gonna talk about. So we have one last question that came through and I'm gonna, since we have some time, I'm gonna ask it and then we'll, then we'll wrap up. Um, if implementing a system like yours, uh, how hard is it to integrate with other products like A-B testing software or localization or personalization? Yes, 
Um, happy to, to answer this question. I, I think it's more specific to our to our technology, which is um, which is obviously fine. Um, I'm going to speak at a high level. I think I think the the uh, the ability of platforms like ours to be flexible and through APIs or other means integrate with other technologies that the enterprise are using is super important. So at a high level, I would say that. Specifically with ours, like we definitely have customers who have integrated our content management with um, different A/B testing platforms they're using. This is at the enterprise level, um, so these are you know these are complicated testing A/B testing platforms, and so it's really important to me as a CEO that our platform has the capability so our customers can do that. So uh, I think the question was how easy is it? Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the examples I've seen, again, this is, this is perhaps like a, a day or, or two process to get integrated with different A-B testing platforms. There's nothing standardized there per se, but it's the flexibility overall that our, that our platform allows that makes that easy to do. But it does raise a really interesting point that I'll harp on for just one minute, <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, A-B testing of transactional emails is actually something that's, that's really valuable to do, especially as we start talking about going down the path of uh, using these emails to increase you know, customer average order size or different things like that. You want to be careful with these emails and, and how you do those things, and you want to test them. You also want to test like what's going to be the most important incentive, right? It might be a... Uh, might be a referral, but it might be some kind of upsell, and, and you, you don't know until you, until you kind of like test and try that out. Uh, there's other benefits to A-B testing in, in transactional email. Oh man, <laughs> not to go down, this is my final statement, I promise. Um, we've got really great examples from customers where they took vital transactional emails, and this is a really quick example. This is from Donors Choose, which is a, an online donation platform for school projects for teachers. It's all, all a nonprofit, and they're, they're an amazing customer. And... Um, Using one of their donation emails, um, their team A-B tested a change just to language. Um, they're just changing their H1 in the, in the email. And it's like, how, do they, how are they communicating to a customer? And through this one A-B test, they realized that they were using the completely wrong messaging for a whole, a whole segment of their customers. And so from this one A-B test, they actually went through and changed the language they use in their, in their website, in their apps, and everywhere else they talk to these, this customer segment, they changed all the messaging they used. And so this is the blind spot they had for literally years, and it wasn't until one, uh, I think, marketing intern decided to just A-B test some language in a transactional email that they identified this blind spot and made this change. So incredibly valuable um, and, and insight that they were to able to draw out of that. I think that's a really good point about, about testing, and you, you never know what you're going to learn when you test. Mm -hmm. I think that's all, all the questions we have now, and uh, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thanks, Matt, for sharing with us this morning, and thanks, everybody, for taking the time out of your day and attending the webinar. It's my pleasure. Thanks for all the great questions today. Really enjoyable.